Hello everyone and welcome back to another Live at Five tour. I am your curator, Kevin Adkison, coming to you from the historic Cranbrook School for Boys Quadrangle. And today our tour is going to be focused on the very center of the quadrangle, the historic fountain from Monreal Cathedral in Palermo, Italy. And welcome everyone back to our ninth month of tours. Um, and again, I'm Kevin Adkison with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. It's a glorious fall day here in Bloomfield Hills and that I would choose something that had been requested for us to discuss and that was outdoors. So if you went to school here at Cranbrook, you probably know this little quadrangle well and its many friends. And so this is the historic Cranbrook School for Boys. It's now one half of the Cranbrook Kingswood Upper School campus with dormitories along one end, the beautiful dining hall here, the Peacock Gates, the original entrance into the school. And then in this corner, we see some of the old farm buildings designed by Albert Kahn and Marcus Burroughs and completed in the 1910s. This is where the Saarinens moved in 1924 when they relocated from Finland to Chicago to Ann Arbor to Bloomfield Hills. And those farm buildings are still used as faculty housing. And then there's the uh, Hoey Hall, which is the main academic building with its tower where the grain silo used to be. And then the library and more dormitories. And right at the center of it all, is the focus of our conversation today, which is going to be a close look here at the fountain. Like all of Cranbrook's fountains this season, they are off, which I thought would allow me to get a little closer, but it also seems like the basin is full of rainwater. So this fountain here is a reproduction of one from Sicily. And the original back in the Mediterranean was constructed as part of the Monreal Cathedral uh, at, in Palermo, Sicily, Italy, between 1174 and 1182. And the Cathedral of Monreal is a pretty interesting example of multiculturalism. Uh, it was built in Sicily for a Norman ruler, William the Good. Uh, and the Normans were, of course, Christianized Vikings from France um, who traveled to Sicily. And then the original was made by Greek artisans and uh, Muslim Arab artists and stone carvers. And so it, this fountain really is from a sort of multicultural center of European history. And William II, or William the Good, was 20 years old when he was the new leader of uh, Sicily, the new king, uh, who also called himself the Caliph, showing again that sort of Arab uh, and uh, Christian blend of cultures. And William the Good fell asleep underneath a carob tree and the Virgin Mary visited him and told him to build a church on the site. And so when he dug up the tree, he found gold coins, which he used to then construct the Monreal Cathedral. And uh, it is known for its mosaics and over 6,000 square meters of gold mosaics. If you haven't visited Sicily, I have not yet, so you can just visit it through Google Image, and it really is quite incredible, the mosaics that are in this cathedral. But right next to it was a little courtyard for a Bene uh, Benedictine monks. And so the cloisters had in it four sides of columns with famed, famous for its sort of double paired marble columns with mosaics and marble carving, again from Islamic artists. And in one corner of the monastery cloister is a little covered fountain. And we might call the fountain um, 
uh, we might just call it a fountain, but in fact, it is a monk's lavatorium. And a lavatorium is not to be confused with a latrine, which is where you would go to the bathroom, but instead the lavatorium is where monks would clean their hands before uh, going into meals. And so young monks would visit the original lavatorium in Montreal, and they would wash their hands in the fountain. And so ours is sort of raised up on a concrete base within this octagonal basin, but the original is actually you would be able to walk up at hand height and use it as a sink. It is interesting if you look at pictures of the fountain back in Italy, it is in an octagonal basin. And so I'm not sure if Saarinen saw photographs of the original basin uh, or if he made it into a octagonal basin because he uses sort of prime shapes throughout the campus. And so, of course, his dining room is an octagon. Um, there are octagonal pavers throughout the pavements here. Um, and so it is a shape that Saarinen was certainly using, but it is also at a much, the, the original is a much smaller octagon, but it does have a, a, a octagonal base in the original. Now, the first time that Booths, who were the creators of Cranbrook, encountered the fountain was with Henry Booth's visit in December of 1922. I've told these stories before here at Live at Five, but uh, Henry Booth was the youngest son of George and Ellen Scripps Booth. He studied architecture at the University of Michigan, and his best friend at Michigan was J. Robert F. Swanson, who was from the Upper Peninsula, spoke Swedish, and they tr were traveling together for a full year in Europe, visiting Germany and Scandinavia, France and Italy. And this fountain and the, the church it was attached to was actually hen on Henry Booth's list of sort of must-see items. And he visited it on Christmas Day, 1922, and he wrote back to Cranbrook, to his parents, uh, and he told his mom and dad how much more beautiful it was from the photographs that he had seen of the, the church and the quadrangle. And he wrote specifically about this fountain and how uh, even though he had seen it in photographs, it was so much more exquisite in person. And he even in the letter that's now in Cranbrook archives did a little sketch of the fountain because he said that the monks would not let them take photographs. He also said that the whole church was overgrown with weeds, but they were flowering uh, and that he wanted to climb across the fountain in order to measure it, but they wouldn't let him. Uh, and so he said it was, it was too cold anyways to get measured drawings. And he said uh, that there was never enough time on their travels to really get close study with things and that he could have spent a year alone at, at the Montreal Cathedral and Cloister. So he would of course return to Ann Arbor to take his senior year in architecture with uh, Bob Swanson under the visiting professor Aliel Saarinen. Now the fountain is in that letter in 1922 and then it comes back in a letter from George Booth to Henry, uh, from father to son, in 1927, when in March of that year, George Booth purchases the uh, reproduction that we see today. And George purchased it not in Sicily, but in Naples on the main boot. Uh, and he purchases it from the Curazzi, uh, the Curazzi foundry. And I've talked about Curazzi before. They were it Italy's main maker of reproduction wares. So the Curazzi company was founded in 1840 in Naples, and it became world famous around the turn of the century when at shows like the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, uh, the Curazzi foundry sent over dozens of marble copies and metal uh, cast bronze sculptures after Renaissance Roman and Greek artisans. At their height, they had about 600 people working at the Curazzi foundry, and they were all master artisans who were educated either at Italy or France's main art schools, or they were educated at the Curazzi's Artisan Academy. They mostly made works in marble, ceramics, and metals, and uh, 
probably if you've been to the Ringling Museum in Sarasota or if you've been to the Getty in Los Angeles, those are great examples of the Curazzi reproduction works. George Booth also did a measure drawing of the fountain in his letter back to Henry, and he described it as having a travertine base with a travertine basin, and then it goes into a white marble shaft up to the carved white marble head. And remember that I said it was carved with uh, both Eastern Orthodox Greek artisans as well as Muslim Arab artist, and so it is an interesting combination of uh, cross-cultural iconography. And this pattern, this zigzag pattern, uh, is actually representative of a palm tree. And palm trees are really important in Islamic art, uh, where artists use non-figural means to exalt God. And so it is a sort of religious connotation with the palm tree sprouting out towards the middle. And then if we look at the top, it has more Romanesque decoration with these robed figures who are moving around this central orb. And then there are the faces that drop the water down when the fountain is on. So the original is spring-fed, ours is a circulating fountain. But I hope you can see the, the figures with their robes and it looks like maybe they're holding a lyre there. And then the faces, animals and humans that are spouting water down. And then at the very top, you see the little acanthus leaves, which are uh, again, more of a Greek and Roman style of stone carving. So it is a, um, a good cross sort of cultural blend of different artistic traditions and techniques. Now, once it was installed here, or once Mr. Booth purchased it, he wrote in that letter of March 1927 that he was hoping Mr. Saarinen would approve of the fountain being placed here in the middle of the quadrangle. I'm not sure what Aelil Saarinen's arguments would have been against placing it here, since George Booth was the client, uh, and of course it does end up here. Uh, but I have heard the story, and I tried to verify it today, but I'm not sure I've ever actually read it written down or if I've just heard it, that in fact Saarinen had already designed a fountain for the center of the quadrangle, and so he simply moved his fountain so that George Booth's reproduction could go in the center of the campus. And so the story goes that this is the fountain that Aelil Saarinen wanted. The reason I question the story is both that I can't find it written down anywhere, and also I'm not sure that this fountain would quite be what Sarnen would have designed in the middle. Uh, it seems pretty perfect for this very tight corner and this very vertical um, design element right in front of the vertical lancet window. So it seems likely to me that this uh, fountain was designed for this position here, and it wasn't in fact moved. Also, George Booth kept very close tabs on all the expenses going into the school, so the idea that a fountain could have been made when he already had this one on the way from Italy seems a little bit iffy to me. But it's, it is a good story, the idea that the fountain uh, was made and moved. Now, over the years, the biology department in the early 1920s um, would use the fountain to have their collection of Michigan fish. So they had bass and trout s swimming around in the fountain. There was also a Cranbrook turtle who lived in here at one point. Uh, in the 1930s, it became the rage for the young boys to test each other's manliness and strength by eating goldfish raw. And so the fountain had goldfish in it and the boys would uh, tease each other into eating the, the goldfish in one swallow. In the 1960s, uh, we have a great photo of the scuba club uh, practicing their scuba routine. I think more as a photo shoot than real uh, practice. Mountain. So it has been used for various uh, pranks and games and teaching throughout the years. And one of my favorite stories is 
uh, in the late 1980s, the senior prank was to move Stegi, the Institute of Sciences fiberglass Stegosaurus, over to the quadrangle and have him sipping water out of the fountain. Now, Aliel Saarinen designed the concrete bench and the lighting to go around it. Uh, it's not quite as tight as, in density as the original at Montreal in the cloister, which really is a, a fairly small space. Here the fountain uh, is much more on its own. But what's wonderful when it is on is the way that the sound of the water drifts into the classrooms and the library and the dining hall. And today we are enjoying the music of a Cranbrook School student drifting into the quadrangle. I don't know if the phone is picking it up, but for Halloween we can come and look at the student pumpkins. It is fun as the fall season moves along. I've noticed pumpkins sprouting at Cranbrook House over at Kingswood. Academy Way is full of pumpkins. I have my pumpkin out at Sarnen House, so we are ready for Friday, Saturday, when is Halloween. So that is our live at five today. Uh, just a closer look at this fountain in the center of the Cranbrook School's quadrangle. If you have any questions, you can type them in. It's now gone. So technology continues to be both a blessing and a curse here at the pandemic. If you're in the area, make sure that you come and walk around campus as we're enjoying the last days of fall color. It is beautiful uh, weather today. I hope you all enjoyed this. I'll be back next Wednesday for another Live at Five on Facebook, Tuesday on Instagram, and on November 15th, Sunday afternoon, a live tour of Mary Chase Perry Stratton's house. Uh, it is now a pri er, it is still a private residence in Gross Point Park, uh, and the homeowners have generously allowed us to come in and see the founder of Powabic Pottery's house uh, that she designed with her husband, the noted Detroit architect uh, William Buck Stratton. Uh, so make sure to sign up for that tour. It's going to be pretty amazing. It's a really amazing house with a very Cranbrook rich collection. So that will be on November 15th. If you're not getting the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research emails, uh, make sure you go to center.cranbrook.edu and sign up, subscribe to our emails. We only send them out once a week on Wednesdays and that's the best way to keep in touch with the goings and comings of Cranbrook. Uh, and we do have still available tickets for our house tours of Saarinen House and the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. And we've even added Saturday at 11 a.m. tours of the Smith House. Uh, in addition to the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 1 p.m. Smith House tours and the uh, sat Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 3.30 Saarinen House tours. So thank you, William the Good, for building this fountain way, way back in the 1180s. Uh, thank you to George Booth and the Curazzi Foundry for uh, making this reproduction in the 1920s. And thank you, lovely, dedicated viewer and Cranbrook supporters for uh, making sure that we have an audience to appreciate the fountain and these stories. And thanks to all the Cranbrook parents and parents of graduates to uh, who also make sure that the fountain stays here and the school continues to educate the youth of Michigan. Thanks everyone. See you next week. Be safe.